live from Liverpool. We need to talk about ghosts with Kevin Eustace. Yes, it is time to talk about ghosts. My name is Kevin Eustace and it is Sunday, which means only one thing. It's time for the Sunday Sermon. How are you all doing? Are you all doing well? There you all answered in union. Yes, or in unison even. Yes. Anyway, we've got a fantastic show full of spectacular merriment for you today. Um, I terrified myself this morning. So I went to bed quite late. I go to bed quite late generally, but I went to bed about maybe 10 to 1. Um, I'm lying in bed trying to scour through some YouTube videos to fall asleep to. Next thing I know, look at the clock and it's five past two. And I'm like, hold on, where's the entire hour gone? And genuinely, because I was so tired for a good 10, 15 minutes, I almost got myself into a panicked, panic attack state thinking I must have been abducted by UFOs. Because that's the most logical reason, as opposed to the clocks being moved forward one hour, as is standard for UK springtime slash summertime. So yeah, I completely forgot that the clocks were going forward and we phoned on it automatically. And I was like, have I had some sort of stroke? Should I check for an implant upon my person? But no, I'd not been abducted. It was simply that the lights are going to, sorry, the nights are going to start getting lighter. Yes, uh, it happens all over the world, doesn't it? It's something to do with farming. Anyway, no one cares about that. Another interesting thing that took place yesterday, before we get all spooky on your ass, as they say in the gangs and the ghettos and stuff, um, we went to Tesco yesterday, which is a supermarket in the UK. And as we're walking in, uh, I noticed like three security guards, not around, but like, you know, like talking to quite officially this one guy. Now, the guy looked very unkempt. It was clear that they were accusing him of stealing. And he had his, he was flailing his arms around, like denying it. Um, now, Becca, to be fair to her, she, she, although she is the most sensible, logical, lovely person that I've ever met in my life, she loves a good bit of drama. She really does. So she was like rubbernecking and turning around and going, oh, look at that. I was like, Come, keep going, keep going. So anyway, on the way out, the police had turned up. And um, the reason I'm telling you this story is because of the, one, the brass neck and the complete hard-facedness of this thief. Um, and also, I've never heard this being done before so as we walk out anyway i then i've got a bit of an interest in the drama so i'm pretending to like take me mask off and see if i've got all me shopping i'm just basically gagging in and um the guy's talking to the police officer and the police officer's saying right so let me get this straight you didn't steal from them but when they took you into the little security room he, he asked you to give him your phone and he, the guy's like, yeah, he took me phone, he took me wallet, there was about two grand in cash in there, now he's got it. And the security guards behind him is in to say, obviously this didn't happen. And then he's like, what else did he say he had? He said, like, my car keys. And the police officer's like, where's your car? He's like, it's at home, it's, I walked. And, you know, it was just horrible. It was just horrible. But at the same time, I thought, Fair, you know what? You know what? It's getting on my high horse. The way the justice system is, he'll probably be paid out for all of them items. I've no idea. He might not. Just thought I'd try and be a little bit right wing. Um, didn't work very well, does it? It's not a nice colour on me, right wing. Anyway, none of this is spooky. Let's get down to some spooky stuff. We've got an amazing series of tales to tell you today. Don't forget, if you've got some spooky stuff to send in, do send it in. I'm all for your stories. Um, we're about... We're catching up now. We've got about, we're in the last two to three weeks of people sending stories in. So we do need more input, more input, as Short Circuit would say. So send your stories in to contact at talkaboutghosts.com and I will read them out. Yes, I will. That's how it works. Um, we've got no guests on today. It's just going to be me throughout. Hooray. I know some people prefer those episodes and some people don't. So Yay if you do, and boo if you don't. I will say this, what well, I've been debating putting the interview episodes out as a separate, still on this feed, but you know, like on a separate day, so that, because I, I do get people saying, oh, I preferred it when it was just you talking, um, and I do get other people saying I prefer the longer episodes with interviews, so to try and keep everyone happy, I might put them out as a separate show. Um, still, we need to talk about ghosts. It's still on this feed. It'll still be automatically in your podcast player. I just mean it might come out on a different day. I'm toying with it. I might not even do it. Just let me know what you think. Anyway, send your stories in to contact at talkaboutghosts.com. I'll repeat that for you. It's contact at talkaboutghosts.com. And I will read your stories out once I receive them. Yes, which is what I'm going to do in this episode. Anywho, don't forget, if you're a fan of the show and you want to see it continue and you're willing to help with that project, then go over to patreon.com forward slash we need to talk about ghosts over there not only will you be supporting the show but you'll also get two extra shows each and every week yes you get a midweek one where i just have a general ramble and try and make you laugh normally 
not very successfully, I'll be completely honest. Sometimes I do that. And on a Sunday, we talk about nothing but the paranormal. And today we're going to talk about demons. Yes, demonic possession. Some of the lesser known cases of demonic possession. Yes, good episode, I do think. So head over to patreon.com forward slash we need to talk about ghosts if you want to sign up for that extra content. And two people have done that this week. The wonderful Chris Sandford and also T.I. Shippers. Now, you may remember Miss T.I. was one of our first guests when we started to do interviews. And she hosts her own show, Ghost Stories with Spooky Miss T.I. Yes, she does. Also a very accomplished author. So thank you to our two wonderful Patreons. As per usual, I'm going to say thank you to you via the medium of song. The guitar is indeed out. And we're going to go a bit bluesy for you two wonderful people today. Yes, we are. And this is your thank you song. Oh, Chris Sanford, Miss T.I., you're keeping the lights on, and I want to say thank you, and you're gonna get to extra shows, and keep the show running, that didn't rhyme. No, it didn't. No, it didn't. A non-rhyming blues song. What I've done there is I incorporated a little bit of jazz because it doesn't have to rhyme. All you snarky people saying that song didn't rhyme. No one's saying that, Kevin. Anyway, big thank you to Chris Sanford and, of course, Miss T.I. Shippers. Um, If you'd like to become a patron, not only would you get yourself a song like what you just heard there, and who wouldn't want that, please, you also get two extra shows a week. So go over to patreon.com forward slash we need to talk about ghosts. Anyway, should we see what weird and wonderful things have been happening in the last seven days? I think we shall. We can we. Yes, it's that wonderful time of the week when we take a look at what weird and wonderful things are taking place on this little planet we like to call the Earth. And this week we have a terrifying tale from TikTok. Get on the alliteration in that sentence. Now, TikTok, of course, is the social media site that puts fear into people of my age. Fear of TikTok into my age, definitely, because we're like, what? I don't get it. So why would I want to do that? Anyway... Um, so this woman has started to hear a daughter laughing to herself. She's like playing on her own and laughing away and imagining things in the bathroom. And she's like, I'll record that. How cute's that? Ah, it all takes a turn for the worse. Dun, dun. Dramatic that, and I never intended that music to be so dramatic, but if you use it right, it can be. Anyway, back to the story. So this woman has shared this bizarre experience on TikTok. I'm taking this from the Daily Mirror in the UK. The parent, known only as Jess, overheard her daughter having a good laugh whilst in the bathroom and she thought it was the cutest thing, started recording, just said all that. Um, Then, a door can be heard slamming and then her little girl spookily proclaims, no one leaves the room. And it is a bit eerie like. Jess looked pretty freaked out by the whole thing and she posted an update revealing more about what happened. In the second TikTok, she claims she asked her daughter what she'd been doing and who she was talking to. The child simply said she'd been talking to a friend. Jess, the parent, added, I know she's talked about having imaginary friends before, but she won't tell me about them. Hmm. So I know what you're all thinking. Can we listen to this spooky, terrifying little girl being almost demonic in her bathroom? Then I I think the answer's yes. I think we can. Are you ready to wear some terrifying children? Here we go. Hello, is that Pamp Wetters Anonymous? Yes, I'd like to sign up for your introductory offer, please. My Lord. That is terrifying. I mean, there's nothing scarier than a child laughing anyway, especially in the middle of the night. That poor mother's outside the bathroom with a mobile phone going, ah, oh, ah, oh, listen to her. Ah, oh, listen to her. Wait a minute, she's Satan. Hello, two priests, please. Yes, one young, one old. You know the drill. That is terrifying. Anyway, that is this week's Week in Weird. We- Weird. Now, we're going to start off today's story section with an update. Do you remember we had Claire on 
um, as an interview the other week, and she was talking about astral projection. Then she was she went on to talk about the care home that she worked in. Well, we've had an update from her because one of the stories she said about the care home was that residents, some residents, would occasionally encounter these like spirit children within the care home, and she sent an update on this. So I'll read this, obviously, because that's the point of the show. Well done, Kev. Well spotted. Claire writes in, Hi, Kev. Hi, Claire. I've been on annual leave from the week prior and up to our video call. I returned to work and was able to ask the most recent resident to encounter the two children about her experience of them. You ready for this? Question and answers with a woman who has seen the dead. I asked the following questions. Number one, what were the children doing in your room? The lady answered. They were playing, while the little boy was, like hide-and-seek in and out of the wardrobe. The little girl was sad. She seemed to be hurting and had a bandage around her head. She was hiding in my bathroom. I kept asking her how could I help her, but she wouldn't answer me. She just kept looking at me with sadness in her eyes. The little boy was encouraging her to play with him, but she didn't want to. Question 2. What did they look like? Around five years old. The little girl had a bandage round her head and was wearing white lace dress. Sorry, a white laced dress, white socks and red buckle shoes. The little boy was wearing navy blue shorts, pale blue shirt with grey knee high socks. Question 3. What were they doing when I came into the room to speak with you? The little boy was running backwards and forwards behind you trying to coax the little girl out of the bathroom, but she wouldn't move. Question 4. How long were they there? About an hour. They only left when the woman in the flower print dress came to collect them. Obviously, question five is, the woman in the flower print dress? Yes, she came into the room about ten minutes after you and said, come along now, children. Then they all left together. And final question, have you seen them again since? No, just that day. Claire goes on to say, This is the first I've ever heard of a woman in the flower print dress. Later on in my shift, another resident who was fully compass mentis called me over and had this to tell me. I couldn't help but overhear your discussion earlier. I've never seen the children you were talking about, but I wake up through the night quite often. Sometimes I see the woman in the floral print dress at the end of my bed. I know she's a ghost. Her dress is like the type I wore in the 50s. I know there are only uniform staff in the building throughout the night. I've not mentioned seeing her before now, in case you all thought I was losing my marbles. Wow. I love it when we get updates to stuff, especially when it's as terrifying as that. Sorry, I've got, uh, you might hear me swallowing throughout this episode. I've got an awful cold. It is just a cold. But unfortunately, it's came with this, I've just run down. It's also came at the same time that I've got an eye ulcer. And if you've ever had a corneal ulcer, you'll know they are the devil's arsehole. So I've had to like, I'm on antibiotic drops in one eye and a painkiller in the eye, like a drop. It makes that eye completely blind and makes the pupil massive like you're on smack or something. So yeah, I look at right treat and I'm reading stuff with one eye and yeah. Anyway, moan, moan, moan. That's all he ever does. But thank you, Claire. What an amazing update. Amazing. Now, in today's episode, we have a series of tales sent in by one listener and They're all bloody amazing, but the listener wishes to remain anonymous, which is fair enough. You know, as I quite rightly say, if you're going to remain anonymous, let me know at the start of your email. And they indeed do. And uh, the email goes like this. Uh, Literally, the title of the email, by the way, is would like to remain anonymous if possible. So, yes, that's fine, of course. Hi, Kev. Hope you're well. I am. Thank you. As I mentioned in the email, I've been meaning to submit the following stories for a while. However, given that many of them are experiences of friends and family members and not just myself, I wanted to speak with those concerned first to clarify the exact details of all the tales they've told me over the years, in brackets, as well as finding out who actually does not mind me sharing the experiences, as some are more personal than others. Now, the following experiences date back as far as 50 years ago, starting with my mum, who, like myself, has always been open to the supernatural and my dad, who despite probably experiencing more than anyone I know, is still a sceptic, and tries to rationalise events that sometimes simply can't be. Another reason I hesitated in submitting these is I was also a little worried that by doing so, I might somehow provoke things into happening again, and with it now being about five years since I've experienced anything personally, I wouldn't want that. See, it's a little line like that which really tees me into someone's email, so well done you. Now, there are quite a few stories, and over the years, I've always tried to think of why this is. 
One reason I believe that this is, is my family is simply huge. With both my mum and dad being one of ten children each. Oh my Christ, did you live in a shoe? So I guess you could say that you would expect us to have more tales than most. Another reason, and one which I believe to be the main culprit, is the actual area where we have always lived in and around. The area in question is pretty old with a lot of history. I believe the main town was given its name by Henry VIII, and all within a couple of miles of each other are a park which locals say housed witches, in brackets, also an old highwayman, and friend of Dick Turpin is said to have been caught and burned to death here. Wow. A creepy monk's monastery, and what used to be an old hanging quarters back in the 18th century. The reason why I say this is that even though the stories have all happened in various locations, they are all no more than a mile from the above three locations. Obviously, this could all be coincidence. Or is it the result of some form of energy that has built up over the decades? Simply put, I do not know. So with this now all being said, I suppose I best get to the stories. I will tell these chronologically. So we'll start with those from my parents, aunties and uncles slash grandparents first, before I eventually move on to my own personal experiences during my 30 plus years. Wow, I tell you what, that's a hell of an intro. You've got me intrigued to death. So I now wish to be terrified out of my pants, please. So let us begin with Anonymous's first story. And this is called The Exorcism of Laura. The first story I'm going to tell you about centres around the property which until this very day my grandparents still reside, and the childhood home of my dad and his nine brothers and sisters. It's a modest three-bedroom semi-detached, so as you can imagine, it's somewhat of a madhouse by all accounts, especially back in the mid-60s, which is where the story began for my family. Now, in terms of the house itself, aesthetically it's always looked pretty normal, nothing spooky at all and it's on a pretty busy road but even now when I enter the property something doesn't sit quite right this is something I felt even before I was told of the following events they seem to start to take place approximately 10 years after my nan and granddad moved to the property or at least it was around this point they started to notice something wasn't quite right at their family home It's also worth noting that at this point my dad was the youngest of ten. He was around five at this point, and his only brother was the eldest out of the whole bunch. Now, being the youngest and being a bit of a cheeky bugger, my dad would always get the blame if household objects or personal possessions would be found in areas of the house they perhaps shouldn't be. For example, photo frames, jewellery, they were often found out in the garden or if rooms were left in an unexplained mess. For example, wardrobes or kitchen cupboards being emptied out onto the floor. However, over time it became apparent that some of the things that began to happen, my dad, at two foot nothing, and as weak as the five-year-old he was, simply couldn't have done. None more apparent than one night in the bedroom, which was shared by none fewer than five of my aunties, And to this day, each of them swear blind the events occurred exactly as I'm about to tell you now. They say it all started in what they guess was the middle of the night, after they'd all initially been to sleep. My Auntie Pauline was the youngest of the sisters, and as would often be the case, her sleep would often be broken by her needing the toilet. So, as normal, she popped herself out of the bed she shared and set off to use the toilet only to be greeted by a bedroom door that just didn't seem to want to open. She turned and pulled the handle as hard as she possibly could, but still no luck. So, being as desperate as she was to have a wee, she woke up one of her older sisters. Needless to say, they wasn't best pleased at being woken, but being the good older sister they were, they got out of bed and went to open the door they thought must have simply been jammed in brackets, or Pauline was simply being too weak. Turning and pulling the handle, she said she initially managed to get the door open six or so inches before then feeling someone on the other side, in brackets, and a whole lot stronger than her, immediately pull it back closed. Having felt the strength firsthand of whoever was on the opposite side, she naturally called out, Dad, is that you? There was no reply. She paused for a second before again attempting to pull the door open. Again, she managed to get it all of six inches before feeling an overpowering force on the opposite side of the handle drag it shut. 
Feeling the aggression of whoever was slamming the door closed, she instinctively grabbed her younger sister and took her back to bed. With all the commotion that was taking place, my dad's other sisters began to wake. What's going on? I'm trying to sleep. By one auntie was greeted with, you need to wake up, someone's on the landing. Obviously, this now grabbed the attention of everybody in the room. And as you would expect, everybody's eyes were now fixed firmly on the door. As they all watched intently, the door handle began to turn gently back and forth. Almost like someone was unsure as to whether or not they wanted to enter. However, within a matter of seconds, the gentle twist turned into the handle shaking and twisting uncontrollably, causing what seemed like the whole door frame to shake. Eyes widened, my aunties were simply stunned, their young heads trying to rationalise what could be going on. But things were only going to become even more unexplainable. Next to the door was a chest of drawers, heavy in weight and full to the brim with clothes. Despite this, it now began to shake, and before the eyes of my disbelieving aunties, the drawers began to open and close of their own free will. Worryingly, it seemed whatever was just on the opposite side of the door was now in the bedroom. In their words, we screamed the house down, until both my nan and grandad burst through the door, only to be greeted by five hysterical girls and a half-open chest of drawers. They themselves had heard nothing at all until the screams of my aunties rang throughout the house. Somehow, they managed to settle my aunties down, telling them we must have had an earthquake. The following morning, nothing was spoken about, not even between the sisters, and the following night, it all appeared normal. So perhaps they thought it could have indeed just been an earthquake. This continued to be the case until a few weeks later, when, as often would be the case, my aunties had friends around the house to play in what was one of the bigger gardens of the area. They said it was a sunny Saturday or Sunday afternoon, and they were about to start a game of tag, or something of that nature. So all the children lined up, and just as the two captains went off to begin picking teams, one of my auntie's friends asked if they could quickly use the toilet. So, off she popped inside the house to use the toilet located upstairs, while the rest of the children continued to pick their teams for team tag in her absence. No more than a couple of minutes later, she reappeared from the house into the garden. She trotted towards the group and whilst doing so muttered the words, I never realised you had an auntie that lived with you. Obviously, this was initially greeted by a mixture of laughter and confusion by my dad's sisters. Before she commented further, Why are you laughing at me? I've just seen a lady on your landing. She was there when I went to the toilet and she was still there when I came out and it definitely wasn't your mum. The confusion that initially hit my aunties was immediately replaced by a sense of fear, especially given what had happened on the landing on their own room just a couple of weeks prior. Furthermore, she was right about not being able to have been my nan, as she was out and it was my grandad on child watch at the time. Now, after some back and forth with their friend, clarifying that they don't have an auntie who resides with them, they summoned my grandad to the garden, where they demanded their friend told him exactly what she had just said to them. His response was to tell the children to follow him, where he proceeded to take a tour of the house to show the children there definitely wasn't anybody there, and also there was no reason to be scared. He simply thought it was just kids being kids, and to his relief, my nan arrived back home to get everything in order. However, it was in conversation with her later on in the evening that he was told that maybe there was some weight to these stories being told by the children. Unbeknownst to my granddad, my nan herself had seen the lady upstairs in the house, only she didn't want to tell him for fear of him branding her silly. She was in Paul's bedroom watching him sleep, leaning over the bed. She even moved his blanket. I could see her as clear as I can see you now, and I know she knew I was there too. My nan told him she could tell she meant no harm. My granddad didn't call her silly, although he did try to rationalise the events, perhaps in a bid to convince himself more than anyone that it couldn't be true. Over the following months, the sightings of a lady on the landing would become a pretty regular occurrence, even by the pop man, similar to a milkman but delivering soft bottle drinks, who asked my nan if that was her sister he could see on the stairs behind her. These sightings coincided with an increase in other activities in the house, what little electrical items they had at the time switching on and off, the knocking of windows and glasses, and the drawing of curtains on their own. Being a busy household, a lot of this would luckily go unnoticed by the children. 
but both my nan and grandad were increasingly conscious of goings on. Years later, my nan would describe this period to her kids, stating that she could feel a pressure building within the house. And what was initially a peaceful presence was now making her feel more and more uneasy by the day. Not by a particular event, simply a feeling, an instinct. With this in mind and on the advice of one of her friends that she'd confided to about the situation, my nan went to speak to the local priest. She was as atheist as they come, so the idea of entering a church was probably a more scary prospect to her than what had been going on back home. It was within this meeting she was surprised to hear from the priest that these kind of stories were pretty normal to him, and that only recently he had aided in performing a clearing at an address not too far from her own. He then went on to ask if my nan had knew anything previously of residence in the property, or anything else of its history. However, the property had been vacant for a few years when my grandparents had moved in, and each of the neighbours had lived on the street for a shorter time than they had. So on that note, the priest said he would like to do some of his own digging around and agreed to visit the property himself the following week. It was this week between the meeting at the church and the day the priest had agreed to visit the house that my family recalled the most aggressive activity occurring. What was originally misplaced items turned into broken, smashed belongings. Picture frames would appear to spring off the walls and my nan said one evening she even felt someone or something tug her hair back in what she felt like was a bid to stop her from climbing the stairs. In brackets, everybody else had already been in bed a while at this point. Perhaps, though, the most weird thing of all, and something I've never really heard about before, was a visible increase in condensation in the house. My aunties recall the house feeling muggy, and not just in the kitchen or bathroom, but literally every single room. Furthermore, during this week, the shaking of the girl's bedroom door handle and chest of drawers would occur nightly. My nan said it was almost as though whatever it was, was well aware of her visit to the priest and her intention to get rid. Following this week of hell, the priest arrived, as he had agreed to, at the property, where my family proceeded to tell him about that week's occurrences. He himself said that upon entering the house, he immediately could sense an unhappy spirit, but that he also had some news regarding the history of the house and what the root of all this activity could be. With the children in the garden playing, the priest proceeded to tell my grandparents that some years prior to them moving into the property, the house belonged to a family of three, a married couple and their five-year-old son, and it was his belief that the spirit in the property was that of the mother or wife. The reason for this being that through his research, he discovered that whilst she was on a trip back to Scotland, where the family originally moved from, her husband and son were tragically killed in a motor accident not too far from the family home. He would then go on to tell my grandparents that the lady in question name was Laura, and that not long after laying her husband and son to rest, she sadly hung herself in what was now their family home. Greeted with this explanation, My granddad once told of how my nan cried her eyes out for no reason other than sympathy for this poor woman. She simply couldn't imagine the heartbreak she must have went through, and she said this might explain why she once saw Laura checking over her own son, who was five himself at the time. This revelation prompted my nan to say Laura can stay. It's just as much her home as ours. However, the priest felt that it was important my nan put this emotion to the back of her mind particularly given the recent increase in activity, and also with the activity becoming physical. My granddad agreed with the priest, and finally, with my nan's blessing, they set a day for the exorcism of Laura's spirit to take place. It's at this point none of my aunties can recall exactly what went on during the procedure, and it's something that neither my nan nor granddad spoke about. Perhaps they felt a sense of guilt, I'm not entirely sure. However, they did confirm there were no more sightings of Laura from this point on, and despite odd happenings here and there in the years following, it all just felt different. Wow, what an amazing story. Thank you very much, Anonymous. It's terrifying, isn't it, to think somebody watching over you whilst you sleep, even in a nice way, like that spirit done. Um, You still got shut over though, didn't you? Get the priests, get them out. Yes. Wow, terrifying. So we're going to have another story from this anonymous person and um, because they're quite lengthy we'll complete the four what do you call four stories I know three's a trilogy what's four we'll complete the quadrangle 
definitely not what it is. Next week on next week's show. But let's have story number two from Mr. Anonymi. This is called The Disappearing Girl. The next story I'm going to tell you is approximately five years on from Laura. But unlike her story is a single event slash experience, which this time only involved my dad. He says he was 10, maybe 11 at the time, and as he would often do, ventured out on the bicycle passed down to him from his older brother. He says he would cover a lot of miles and miles at a time, and on this particular afternoon found himself on the canal, in brackets, a lot further from home than he should have been, but then again, my dad has always been somewhat of a rebel. Whilst pedalling down said canal, he said he spotted a young girl in the distance. The closer he got, the more he thought to himself, ah, she's a bit of all right. And so, as you'd probably expect any young lad to do, continued to pedal towards her in a bid to show off on his bike. As I mentioned, my dad was a little maverick, so it wasn't out of the norm for him to be somewhere on his own he shouldn't be. But he did feel it was odd that a young girl who appeared to be the same age as him would be there, apparently alone. What are you doing here? he asked. It's a bit dodgy down here, he continued. She replied that she came for a walk, but like him had ventured a little too far from home and now was lost. In addition to this, she said she didn't feel the best either. So acting grown up for a rare change, my dad offered to help her get back home as it was on his way anyway. In brackets, he said it was actually a few miles out, but he wanted to score some brownie points. Come on then, I'll give you a backy, he said, as she grabbed my dad around the waist and stood on the stud pedals behind him. He says he can specifically remember this as it was the first time a girl other than one of his own sisters had hugged him. So off they went, my dad feeling like a hero with his new friend holding on tight. He said after being initially somewhat sheepish, she would not shut up whilst on the ride to get her back home, giving my dad a feeling of, I'm definitely in here. As the miles passed, She continued to redirect my dad, even showing him some shortcuts along the way. He recalls thinking, Jesus, you're a long way from home. But he didn't mind as it meant he got to hang out with her even longer. He doesn't remember many details of exactly what else they spoke about, but he said eventually they ended up on the street that she lived. Mine's the second to the last house on the right, she said as my dad gave the pedals one last burst of acceleration to complete his rescue mission and save the damsel in distress. However, the thrill of this final burst was quickly overtaken by immediate panic, as my dad could no longer feel her arms around him. Bloody hell, she's came off, he yelped. He knew she couldn't have jumped or hopped, as he was simply moving too quick. Now, this is where the confusion in my dad's young brain kicked in, because as he looked down the path behind him, she wasn't there. He abandoned his bike and on foot proceeded to search for the girl that up until only seconds earlier had been on the back of his bike. He says he can remember thinking this was maybe her playing a trick, but as he continued to look there was simply nowhere she could be hiding, and she certainly couldn't have fallen off. Wow, this is mad, were his next thoughts. Now, almost angry at the thought of being the victim of someone else's joke, he decided to go and knock on the door of the house where she lived. He approached the house, and as he did, he noticed that there were people sat in the living room, one of which spotted my dad and in doing so got up to greet my dad at the door. Hello, young man, how can I help you? A young girl then ran up behind this man. It wasn't the same girl my dad had earlier rescued, but she did look quite similar. This seemed to confirm to my dad that the girl in question must indeed have lived here as well. I think I've just had your daughter on the back of my bike, but now I don't know where she is. Has she snuck in here? He muttered. This is my daughter here, and I can assure you she's been here with me all day, the man replied, almost laughing as he did. She looks like her, but a bit older. She said she was the same age as me. She was literally just here, my dad replied frustratingly. To this, there was no response from the man in the doorway, and he certainly wasn't chuckling anymore. I was on the canal, and she said she was lost, so I brought her all the way back here, but now she's gone. She looks like her, but older, he kept repeating. To this day, my dad says he can remember the colour draining out of the man's face. You're not taking the piss, are you, son? Finally replied the man. This confused my dad as he was simply trying to do something nice for a change. 
and now he felt like he was being accused of somehow doing something wrong. She was on my bike, she told me where to come. You're definitely not telling lies, asked the man. At this point with his eyes watery and his hands visibly shaking. Why would I, said my dad. Appearing now to accept that my dad was telling him the truth, after all, why would he be lying? He proceeded to question him further, not in an aggressive or querying manner, more like he just wanted to know. My dad told him all he experienced, but was still none the wiser himself as to where the girl had gone that was holding onto his waist for over half an hour. Managing to regain his composure, the gentleman explained to my dad that he believed the girl was indeed his daughter. However, my dad could never have anticipated what he was about to be told next. Crushingly, the man revealed that he had another daughter, similar age to my dad, who had passed away 18 months prior, following an incident on the same canal. He didn't say exactly what that incident was, but told my dad this is who he believes was on the back of his bike, and in somewhat a turnaround of events, he thanked my dad for the message. My dad didn't probe for any further details, and even in all the years since, has never sought to find out anything more. In his eyes, he believes in what the man was telling him, and the man believed what my dad was telling him, and that's all that he needed. Wow, that is, it's beautiful. I mean, I normally don't like stories where it's a bit lovey-dovey, and it's like, I got a message for ya, but... um. That's both terrifying and beautiful at the same time. So I like that. Imagine seeing a ghost girl at the canal, giving her a backy or a lift, and then they're going, yes, yeah, take me home, please. And when you get there, that exact thing's happen. Her dad says, no, no, she's, she's dead. She's dead. You've got a ghost on the back of your bike. I'd be like, oh my God, can I please have a new seat for my bike, mother? Wow. Amazing. Thank you very much, Anonymous. And we will be completing your tales of terror next week on the show. So thank you very much. Don't forget, if you've got stories that you want me to read out or you want to be interviewed by me to discuss your paranormal peculiarities, email contact at talkaboutghosts.com and we can sort that all out. OK, I'm going to go now because I need to go and swill my eye out because that's a lovely thing to do. I hope you all have a fantastic week. For Patreons, I will be speaking to you shortly about demons. And don't forget, you can sign up to Patreon at patreon.com forward slash we need to talk about ghosts. Um, and in the meantime and in between time, just take care of yourselves and each other. Copyright Jeremy Springer, mid-90s styly. Okay then, guys. I love you all. Tatty bye.